Amen. Amen. Um, evangelism. You know, yesterday we talked just to review, and I'm not going to review a lot because it eats into our time every, uh, every session. Uh, but yesterday we talked a little bit about the gospel, and uh, we read a, uh, a verse in Mark 16, and he, meaning Jesus, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the act of doing that is called evangelism. Evangelism. And so the question that I want to look at today is whether or not evangelism is a new thing. Well, right away you're probably thinking, well, it's not too new. Because what we read in, in uh, Mark 16 was about 2,000 years ago. So we know that it's a, at least 2,000 years old. But I want to examine something that goes even beyond that and determine whether or not it's always been in the mind of God and in the purpose of God to see the will of God promoted in all the world from the very beginning. And we're going to look at that, that evangelism really, in a way, didn't start only with the New Testament, that God always wanted His will his word and his people to spread throughout the earth. It's always been his intent. Uh, probably the most quoted Bible passage, when oh, I've got them all written down here, when considering evangelism is Matthew and, uh, 28, uh, verses 19 and 20, and uh, Bishop Sam uh, referred to that this morning. Jesus is speaking to his disciples before his ascension. And he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, and this is the encouragement. We're going to get into this a little bit more later. This is why this time around we can do it. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. And these are little trailers or previews that you're getting. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Part of what he says there is making disciples, baptizing, and teaching them to observe all things Christ commanded. And we're going to get to that part in a later session. To that part, because I do think that the whole idea of evangelism has been greatly watered down to the point that people who are, quote, evangelized have come to believe that they are truly Christians if they would just say, oh, okay, I believe. And that's the end of it. But you see, in the order or in the command to evangelize, included in that is that they are to be uh, taught to observe all the things that Jesus commanded them that they're, and they're to be baptized. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, for now, it's enough to know that a simple de definition, we need to know this, a simple definition of disciple. Disciple. I, I think sort of an easy way to remember uh, the definition or definitions of disciples is, and we, we refer to this sometime in our, in our, at our parish, in our Sunday school class and in church, uh, we might make a reference to disciples, big D, disciples, big D, or disciples, little D, okay? Disciples, big D, when we talk about the, the disciples, we're usually talking about the 12, the 12. But all of us, all of us are disciples, little D, disciples, little D. The basic definition is kind of like gospel. There's a, there's a very simple definition, and then there's a more complicated or a more profound definition of what disciples are or who disciples are. The easy definition for disciples, stick with me now, I've already lost a couple. The easy definition for disciples are followers. Disciples are followers. They're followers. Disciples isn't a new thing in, uh, for the New Testament. Disciples have always been around. Followers of teachers, philosophers. The great philosophers had disciples. 
They would follow them around and learn from them. So to be a true disciple, and why be a fake disciple, or why be a phony disciple? If we're going to be disciples, let's be true disciples. Why would you want to be fake or phony anything? So if we're going to be disciples, let's be true disciples. And true disciples follow their leader or follow their teacher. And in the case of Christians, that would be Jesus Christ. So true disciples follow him, and they follow him for a specific reason, and that's to learn from him. And they learn, the disciples, the original disciples, learned by listening to what he says and watching what he does. That's half of it. Listening to what he says, watching what he does. That's the first half, and a lot of people do that. We have churches full of people that listen and watch full of people that listen and watch. That's the easy part. The second part of being a true disciple is by copying him, by emulating him, by imitating him. That's a true disciple. They listen and watch for a specific purpose because they believe he's the one that truly is the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He really is the way. And so the reason I'm watching him and listening to him is so that I can learn to be like him and to follow him. So true disciples are followers who watch, who listen, and who learn for a specific purpose. That's because, Bishop, this morning you referred to that statement. Uh, you, can, you can take that to the bank. Or they, what was the actual uh, uh, line in the reading? Um, he took Jesus at his word. He took Jesus at his word. How do we know they took Jesus at their word? Because they listened to his word, and then they put his word into practice. I, I, I've, been, I've been ordained for about 30 years, and I, I'll be honest with you. I have a real difficult time uh, watching someone who says that they believe but really never take Jesus at his word. That's what I mean about the gospel has been somewhat watered down. As long as we say, oh, sure, I believe. But you know, Scripture actually says that the devil believed. The demons believed. And they trembled. We don't want to tremble. We want to believe. We want to have faith because we truly, truly believe that that's the way to go. That you can take his word to the bank. Not only his word, his actions. That that's the best way to be is like Christ. And so we follow, we follow him. Now, back to the question, the original question. Is evangelism, is evangelism, or is the command to evangelize something which began with the New Testament, or is it something that's even older than that? Is it something that has always been in the mind or in the purpose of God? Is it something that he has always wanted his people to do? going to look at that for a moment and see how ancient this whole idea really is. So to do that, how far back, what's the oldest we can get, not the oldest book written, but what's in history, the oldest that we can get when looking at the Bible would be Genesis 1. You can't get any further back than Genesis 1. Now I want you to listen carefully. If you have, if you have a Bible, if we want to pass out some, let's do that. Well, I'm reading out of a different translation. That might make it different, more, even more complicated. Or maybe NIV and a King James. I'm reading out of New King James. Maybe a ESV. That might just really scramble the eggs up there. Let me just read. You can listen. Genesis 1, verses 26 and 28. This is how old the idea is. God, then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. Over all the earth. Now you remember that line, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. In Matthew, this is Genesis 1. Over all the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. 
And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. When we uh, are evangelistic, we are also being fruitful and multiply in more of a spiritual sense. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. We're subduing the earth when we evangelize. Have dominion over every living thing, teaching them to do everything that I've commanded. Uh, dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then in Genesis, the very next chapter, in Genesis 2, 8, and 15, we read this. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Then the Lord God took the man, and he put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. To tend and keep it. That's Genesis 2, 8, and then 2, 15. Verse 8 and verse 15. So, I'm going to do this. Is there, uh, is there an eraser for this board, or do we use napkin, or what do we use here? Uh, the thingy. All right. Simple images. I'd like, if, if I'm going to draw things, I'd like stick figures and things like this, you know. And that's not too bad. Um, it's kind of, you know. Pretty good for a circle. Um, let's say that that circle represents the entire earth. The entire earth. And in the earth, in the earth, the Lord, according to Genesis 2 8, the Lord planted a garden. And we know that as a garden of Eden. The Lord planted a garden. And if we read about that garden, we read how beautiful and how perfect. The garden was. We don't get a lot of information about what it looked like outside the garden. But apparently, it wasn't the same as it was inside the garden. Because God said to take dominion over everything, over all the earth, over the whole thing. But when we read the description of the garden, it appears that that was already taking place within the garden. The reason I say that is because when God spoke to Adam and he said, I'm going to read this again. Let us make, uh, let's, I don't want to skip all that. Let's see, let's see. Let them, meaning man, let them have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps in the earth, God plant, uh, created man in his own image. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. <clears throat> How in the world would the first man know what a subdued earth looked like? He didn't have a Bible. He, he didn't, he, there, there wasn't this whole cultural thing, and, and we can tell whether things are going well or whether they're not going well or which way the culture's moving. He didn't have all that. So how did the first man know what a subdued earth looked like? By the model. By the model. So two things he had to do. He had to tend the garden. He had to tend that. And on this, he had to subdue and take the menu. He had to tend the garden. Why? Because it was perfect. It was perfect. And you want to keep it that way. You want to keep it that way. Nice, clean, peaceful, joyful, plentiful. Had to keep it that way. But apparently the rest of the earth wasn't like that because God said, subdue it and take dominion over it. In other words, make all of this like that. Make all of this like that. Wouldn't it just be absolutely beautiful if the whole earth was like the description we get of the Garden of Eden? That would be absolutely beautiful. Wonderful. Now, you're thinking, okay, that's really great. What's that got to do with uh, uh, spreading the gospel and all of that stuff? 
Well, keep in mind, keep in mind, he was the first man, Adam was the first man. Adam was the first man. And again, how did he know what things were supposed to be like? Because God created this, the garden, he looked at it and said, it is good. Then he put man in it, man who was in his own image, put man in the garden, and then he said, it is very good. You know, he kept creating things every day and saying, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then he created man and put him there and he says, now it's very good. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Now it's very good. So he said, okay, what I want you to do is you keep this good and you make the rest of all of this. You know, God could have done that. God could have done that. I mean, if he created the Garden of Eden and made it so beautiful and so perfect, he could have just done the whole world that way. But God put man, he could have kept us in heaven. He didn't have to put us here. But God put us here, and he gave us a task, and it's always been that way. The task has always been to work in such a way is to make this a much nicer place like the Garden of Eden. And Adam had an example of what that was supposed to be like. Well, the plan failed. God didn't fail. God knew what was happening. But the plan failed because in the very Next chapter in Genesis 3, what happened? Does anybody know, besides ministers, does any, do any of our students know what happened in Genesis 3? There was an apple tree. Pardon me? Ah, there was that tree, yes. Uh, in Genesis 3, man failed. Man fell. Now, I want you to know something about that. Keep this in mind. You had the perfect man, the perfect man in the perfect place with only one rule. Who couldn't do that? Us. <laughs> Us. That just shows that something else needs to happen before we can fulfill God's plan concerning the rest of the earth concerning the rest of the earth. Now, I'm going back to Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Jesus is speaking to his disciples before his ascension back to the Father, and he says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, and I'm going to draw a little, some little parallels in just a moment. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then, after the Gospels, in the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit descending on the church, and we remember a promise. We remember a promise. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you shall have power to be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, and then where? Over the whole earth. That sounds a little familiar to me. A little familiar to me. Why did it fail the first time? We're going to talk about that. Why can it work the second time? We're going to talk about that. But nevertheless, in Acts chapter 2, the church started. Watch this. Spirit came and the New Testament church began. Be fruitful 
and multiply. Here, how, what is it that needs, and this is, this may be, this may be why evangelism is not progressing at the rate that it ought to be. Because not only are we not evangelizing a lot, we're also not tending a lot. Because we look at the church that started off as the Garden of Eden, what a perfect place. We read Acts and we go, wow, look at this. Everybody's together, everybody's in one accord, and that's not a Honda. Everybody's in one accord, all unified, a little American humor there. Everybody's uh, uh, in one accord and unified. People are being healed. The church is growing. 2,000 added, 4,000 added. The church is growing. These evangelists and disciples are going, going out and telling other people about Jesus, and they're believing, and they're being baptized, and they're going into their town. Their whole households are being baptized, and on and on and on and on and on. Things are looking really, really well. I mean, there are problems here and there in the church. We read about all of that in the epistles. Matter of fact, one of the reasons the epistles were read, uh, written is to tell us about all the problems and how to deal with them. But the point is, they were dealt with. They were in the church, the problems, they were tended. The church is now the garden of the world. And so the church, first of all, needs to be tended. We cannot turn a blind eye to some of the things happening in the church. We must stand firm because first of all, if we fathers, if we fathers don't observe all things that he has commanded, then how in the world can we go into the world and teach them to observe all of the things he's commanded? They're looking at us and going, yeah, right. In the United States, I don't know how it is here, in the United States, one of the biggest complaints about the church and one of the main reasons that people say that they don't go to church is because of all of the hypocrites in the church. You preach all this stuff, but you don't do any of it, is what they say. The church has to be tended. So this part of the message is to the fathers. Father deacons, father priests, father bishops, to the fathers. It's our duty to tend the church. If we don't, yeah. no one will. Having tended the church and watching the church and try to preserve the purity and the integrity and the orthodoxy of the church is tending it. Okay? Now, when the church is tended, we can begin to encourage our people, to encourage our people to go out in the world, and again, to go out in the world, making disciples, making other followers, making such as we are, those who follow Jesus, who listen to what he says, who observe how he acts, and who imitate that, making followers of all nations, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. Sadly, many aspects of the church, and by the way, don't ever be fooled. Just because there's a sign in front of a building with a steeple that says church does not make it so. <laughs> if it has lacked so much in its tending, I mean, that's like the Garden of Eden growing up with all kind of weeds, and you go in there and the snakes bite you, and animals jump on you, and nothing will grow properly. But the sign out front still says Garden of Eden. You know? It's, it's sort of time to take that sign and move it elsewhere. All right? It's like that. So we tend the church. Now, let me show you some of the parallels in, from Genesis. To the Gospels, to Mark, to Matthew. We have 
the commands in Genesis 1 and 2 things too. <laughs> Number three, make disciples. Tend and keep the garden. Tend and keep the church. Okay? Everybody see the parallel there? Everybody see this? Can you see it? Okay? Number two, take dominion and subdue the earth. Teach them, meaning all these places all over, everyone all over the earth. How do you, how do you take dominion and subdue things? I, I, I'm going to take a little sidetrack here in a moment. Teach them to observe these things. That's how you take dominion and subdue. The word dominion has some harsh sounding implications, and it's not like that. Taking dominion taking charge over something, becoming a manager of something, always remembering, and what's the difference between a, between a landlord, a manager, and an owner? What's the difference between a manager and an owner? A manager manages something that is not his own. Exactly, exactly. Uh, this is God's world. Adam was a manager. He was to tend. A steward. A steward. And we are his disciples, and we are managers, managers of God's creation. So to take dominion and subdue really means to properly manage it, to manage things, to be in charge. A manager is in charge of the staff. If you walk into a grocery store or a restaurant that's just nasty and in disarray and, and nothing looks well, it's not the waitress's fault, not even the cook's fault, it's the manager's fault. It's the manager's fault. We don't like a lot of the things that we see happening in the earth. Guess who the managers are? Those who say they're the disciples. God has called us, called us to manage his creation. 
We cannot manage his creation if we don't observe the things that he has commanded and thereby teach them to observe these things. I, I tell you, I, I, was, uh, I didn't go into the ministry until I was in my early 30s. And before that, I was a manager. I was a manager. And one of the complaints that I hear from people, from employees, is why should I do this? Why should I care about this place? The manager doesn't even care about this place. Uh, why should I work hard to make this a good place? The guy who's in charge, he doesn't even ever show up. So the managers have to observe everything that Christ commanded. Doing that, he earns respect. He's not called a hypocrite. And he can therefore teach others to observe those things. And thereby he is managing and that perpetuates itself and new disciples are made. New disciples are made. So this whole idea of evangelism in regard to uh, spreading the will of God throughout the earth isn't new. It's always been the plan of God. But man on his own couldn't do it, even though he was commanded, even though he was the perfect man, even though he was in the perfect environment, and even though he only had one rule that he needed to keep. He still couldn't do it by himself. Now, we're going to get into what the major differences are. The major differences are, but a clue, a clue to the difference between Matthew 28, that's what we call the Great Commission, where we're commanded or commissioned to go into all the earth. And this is called, let me write that down for those of you who don't know. This is called the cultural mandate, not suggestion. And this is called the great commission. <laughs> they have a lot in common just to give you a clue of where we're going to be going in this is the last line here <coughs> is Jesus saying and lo I am with you always lo I am with you always it's not only God giving a command to man and then saying, okay, go for it. You've got it. It's God giving a command to man and then saying, as you're doing this, I'm right here. I'm by you. I'm in you. I'm behind you. I'm in front of you. He's like the cloud and the flame in the Exodus. Always there. Always there. All around us. All around us. As a matter of fact, if you take this theme and you work this theme all the way, and I already just told you something about Exodus, all the way through the Old Testament until you get here, then you can get here and you can breathe and say, now I can see why this would work this time around. This time around. Because a the theme follows throughout the entire Old Testament right up to the New. So again, God did not give up his idea because man fell. God does not give up his plans because we mess up. God is in charge no matter how badly we mess up. He is faithful even when we're faithless. That doesn't mean that we don't suffer the consequences of our faithlessness in our own lives, but don't blame God. He's faithful. His word will come to pass. God didn't came up. Christ came to redeem man and also to advance his kingdom. And this whole idea of dominion, I was about to say that a minute ago, that has these bad connotations because it sounds harsh. I'm going to take dominion over you. Dominion. Dominion is achieved through serving others. Through serving others. If you watch what goes on around here, 
and the way people are won over under Bishop Meyer's ministry, you'll s and of which he is in charge, you'll see that he is taking dominion and making disciples through his service. People come here hungry, what does he do? Feed them. He feeds them. People come here hurting and wounded and confused. Yeah, they're okay. counseled, they're prayed for, they're housed. People who come here without a place to sleep, they get a place to sleep. People keep here and come here hungry, they get something to eat. People come here cold, they're made warm. People come here with all sorts of mental problems and everything else, and he prays for them, and he ministers. In Christianity, the word dominion has different connotations, different meanings than in the world. And dominion in the, in the world sounds like a master and a slave. Dominion in Christianity is the other way around. The servant takes dominion. The one willing to feed and to clothe and to guide and to comfort takes dominion. So now we have another model. We have another model. It's not the Garden of Eden. Sounds real nice. I bet there's great fishing in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, the church, the church and his disciples, us, if we're truly disciples, you, know, you can ask yourself the question, am I really a disciple of Christ? Uh, do I listen to them? You, know, you go to church and stuff and you hear, hear the word being read and the Psalms and all, then you're, you're, you've heard him, you're listening. But Jesus said, that for those who have ears, let them hear. And he saw the ears on the people. That's not what he meant. My father used to say something to me and then he'd say, are you listening? Are you listening to me? When he asked me, are you listening, he wasn't asking me if I was just hearing the sound. He asked me if I was paying attention and I'm ready to obey. You see? So we listen to Christ, we watch him, we observe him, we follow him, and then we start doing what he commands, we start following his actions, we start following his teachings. We are to take care that the church is properly tended and kept, my brothers. Uh, and that is becoming a more and more difficult job. Uh, and we are to expand the boundaries of the church. As Adam was to expand the boundaries of the garden. The garden was supposed to get bigger and bigger and bigger until the whole earth was kind of like a garden. The church is supposed to get bigger and bigger and bigger. This progressive thing bigger and bigger and bigger as we make disciples. So I'm going to end with this. Uh, I'm going to end with this question. The question, and I've given you a hint already, and we'll talk about this more. The question was, if it didn't work here, in those perfect circumstances, if it didn't work there, since it didn't work the first time, what makes us think that it could possibly work this time around, and that's what we'll cover tomorrow, okay? All right? Okay, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome.